Elizabeth from Dermatology. I'm working here as an assistant professor. And you all know that today we have a class on viral infections. This is a very important topic which you commonly see in our clinical settings. So uh, this is also very important in the scenario of today's pandemic. So we'll just wasting further time. We'll start up with the today's lecture. Okay, now to start off with, what is a virus? Virus, you all know, is an infective agent, which consists of a nucleic acid center located DNA or RNA within a protein shell, the capsid. This you cannot visualize with your naked eye. You need to have a light microscopy for this. This agent is inactive outside its host, but it has very tremendous ability to multiply within the living cells of the host. Now, have a look at the picture which we have discussed. This is the DNA material or the RNA material, the nucleic acid, okay? This is a protein core, coat, which is known as capsid. Okay, some of the virus are enveloped, which has a, this green, which is represented in a green-like covering. This is made up of fat, but some of the virus lacks this envelope. And these are the spike proteins, which are specific for attacking the specific cells, okay? This is the whole structure of a virus, the infective material. The nucleic acid inside, surrounded by a protein covering that is known as capsid or a protein code. Then some of the virus have this envelope and some are non-enveloped. And on this and protein code or the envelope, we have these small tiny projections which are called as spike proteins. Okay, how this a virus cause disease to the host? The portal of entry could be mucous membrane through inhalation or ingestion or via contact. Different modes of in, uh, entering into the body. We, in the skin, we are more concerned about the pathogen entering through the contact or sometimes inhalation. Like in certain virus, we'll see like herpes simplex can also be acquired through inhalation. Skin act as a portal of entry in majority of the cutaneous manifestations which are caused by these viruses. But again, the inhalation is also a mode of transmission. Once they, they are in, enter into the body, they are taken up into the specific cells by phagocytosis or endocytosis. After the entry, the pre-existing cell enzyme, the enzymes which are inside the cells, actually trying to remove it or damage the capsid, release the nucleic acid. Okay, that protein coat is denatured or ruptured or damaged, and this causes the release of nucleic acid. Once this nucleic acid is released, it start, it goes through the process of transcription, translation, making multiple thousands, millions of copies of this viral nucleic acid. And this is the how the disease manifestation starts. Okay, now. A little brief discussion on the classification of the viruses. Viruses, the nucleic material, some of the viruses are DNA viruses and some of the nuclear material are the RNA viruses. Again, the DNA viruses could be a single-stranded, it could be a double-stranded, or it could be a complex thing. Single-stranded, double-stranded, or a complex, a mixture of both. Again, they are non-enveloped, enveloped, and non-enveloped. They are further classified into enveloped and non-enveloped. The more, the most important we are considering here are this herpes viridi family, which belongs to a double-stranded DNA virus, which will be discussing the diseases like herpes simplex virus and varicella zoster virus. So this herpes viridi family is very important in the DNA viruses, which are double-stranded. As Another, with respect to the dermatological manifestation, 
the other important family is this foxviridae okay we'll be discussing this like molluscum okay the disease causes mollusca this is the classification a broader classification not a detailed one but a broader classification that you would be able to remember that's dna viruses now the rna viruses these rna viruses are also again divided into similar single stranded and the double stranded again they are divided into each of the group is usually divided into envelope and non envelope while the double stranded has only non envelope and the single stranded are only enveloped as well here what, which um, class which are we going to mostly concentrate is this paramyxovirus of measles okay this filoviridae family has dengue virus and this coronaviridae okay so we'll be discussing um some of the most important cutaneous manifestations which are caused by these number of dna and the rna viruses okay now going to the lab test those in dermatological we usually don't go for these investigations but as the clinical picture is quite uh you can say uh, specific for each of these viruses and the history together with the clinical picture is enough to make a diagnosis but if you have a systemic infection and wherever there is any uh, query about the diagnosis you can go through all these investigations which i'll be discussing zank smear this is basically what we do the lesion is usually cut off or is scraped what you can say it is scraped the material is taken and it is then uh, what you can say smeared on the slide and then with a special stain it is being observed under the light microscope so this zank smear is basically taking the material from the lesion smearing it on the slide and visualizing it under the light microscope what it can uh, what are the features which can points towards the zank smear that it has a possible viral cause there are certain type of specific cells which you can say coelocytes these are the specific cells which are infected by the viral antigen and has some special characteristics along with that may have some giant cells clusters of cells with multinucleation that can hint towards the viral infection cultures cultures of the tissue cultures of the skin samples scraping can be done this is usually require specific cultures of cells or sometimes it can be done on egg and certain other medium histology the diagnosis can be very much well established with the use of skin biopsy and sending it to the histopathology electron microscopy this is different from light microscopy here you see the ultra structures of the cells okay so these are the few investigations which can be done from the direct tissue vesicle fluids can be taken on the glass slide for all these things like the zank smear electron microscopy now these are the tests which is usually done fluorescent antibodies are usually taken from the tissue as well we use the tagged antibodies to see it under the fluorescence microscope these antigens combined together with certain antibodies give you fluorescent these uh pcr are reverse transcriptase pcr uh, these are very much diagnostic and they have a very high yield and they can be very helpful in diagnosing like what we are doing for the coronavirus in which we are taking the samples from the nasal areas or the throat so you can have these tests then the serological tests are very important the serological antibody tests which can be which should be ideally done with two samples one at the onset of the rash and the second on the 10th day so you will help to this will help you to differentiate between the uh, uh this increase in the titer of the antibodies between these two tests can helpful for the diagnosis so you can go through all these tests like zank smear culture histopathology electron microscopy fluorescent antibodies these rna uh pcr reverse transcriptase pcr or the serological test okay okay now to start with the specific disease 
The first and the foremost is the herpes simplex virus infection. This is the commonest infections which are present throughout the world, affecting usually the whole of the population. There are two main serotypes. One is herpes simplex virus 1, which mostly causes facial infections, and HSV type 2, that is herpes simplex virus type 2 genital infections, which are causing the genital infection. But keep this in mind, though predominantly HSV1 is involved in the facial disease and 2 in the genital, but they can really be switched that the genital, the strain 2 is causing the facial lesion and 1 is causing the genital lesion. What is the mode of transmission? The direct contact of the droplets or the infective secretions from the saliva or the genital secretions. Okay, one thing very specific about this group of DNA virus is that it stays persistent in the ganglia of the sensory nerves in awaiting the primary infection site. So along with the primary infection, it can give you recurrent and secondary infections as well. Primary infection is one that occurs in the host which has never been affected with by this virus previously that the host is zero negative it the host lacks the antibodies okay so primary infection we'll talk about this is commonly termed as herpes labialis the causative organism is again hsv type 1 this herpes simplex virus infect this is the herpes simplex virus infection of the mouth and the lips herpes labialis is the infection of the mouth and the lips which is caused by herpes simplex type 1 there are certain triggering factors which can be uh, play a role in the recurrent infection like simple trauma fever infections ultraviolet light okay how do they look like the primary Herpes simplex virus 1 can present with the small clusters, vesicles. Look at the picture on the right side. They are a group of vesicles which are present on the lower lip. Or they can be present anywhere on the face as well in a group-like distribution. But keep this in mind. We'll be discussing the herpes zoster infection. That is different from it. That is caused by varicella. And here we are talking about herpes simplex. It does not involve the whole dermatome. It is usually localized to a small site. Okay, the commonest presentation which we'll be seeing is gingival stomatitis. Let's go to the picture here. Whole erythematous gingiva. This is the commonest and a very painful presentation. These are the different presentations. Oral ulcers, ulcers present on the tongue, the pharyngeal wall the lips and the gingiva. Any type of presentation can come up in this herpes simplex infection. Okay, what are the symptoms? The patient has high grade fever, he's restless, there is excessive dribbling from the mouth as the gingiva and stoma, uh, the stomal mucosa is involved, drinking and eating become very painful, Bre breath is foul smell, gums are swollen and red and they can bleed easily. Whitish vesicles, they can be present that evolved into ulcers on the tongue, throat, palate, and inside the cheeks. And there are localized lymph adenopathy. Usually, what is the recovery time? It is two weeks. It can recover. The patient can recover within two weeks. Keep this in mind. In the acute infection in the oral mucosa, sometimes the vesicles are very hard to differentiate because they rapidly go through ulceration. Okay, so this is the herpes simplex virus infection causing herpes labialis. And the other presentation is herpes gingival stomatitis. So you can have either of these presentations. But this is primary, that the patient has never been exposed to this infection previously. Now, the recurrent infection. This recurrent infection, as the name suggests, it can come up later in the life multiple times. It can be about two to six times per year. But how will you differentiate? The patient will give you a history of previous lesions occurring on this uh, lip, around the lips, around the genitals, around the other areas of the face. But how would the vesicles look like? They are smaller and they're more closely grouped. They are smaller and they are more closely grouped. And most frequently, what are the sites? The face, particularly the lips. 
itching and the burning, mild tingling sensation can be present. Healing is usually seven to 10 days. In the primary lesion, the, he the healing phase takes a little longer. And in this, the healing might be a little early. And the person may have constitutional symptoms of fever, pain, and enlarged lymph adenopathy. Okay. These are the pictures you can see. This is simple what you'll uh, name this uh, presentation, herpes labialis. Okay, herpes simplex. They can be present in the buccal mucosa, in the mucosa, over the tongue, over the pharyngeal, posterior pharyngeal walls, uvula, or the gingivostoma. Okay, the, now there are a number of complications which can come up with even the cutaneous manifestation. The primary infection which has occurred in the patient, patient's for the first time can uh, give rise to complications like eczema herpeticum. You not be very much familiar with this eczema herpeticum, but what is this? This is again a cutaneous presentation of an exaggerated, or you can say a complication of herpes simplex virus. How does it present? There is a widespread eruption of umbilicated lesion. What is an umbilicated lesion? They, these are the papules which have a central dip or a depression just like the umbilicus of your in the abdomen. So these lesions can come up with a very rampant presentation, pharyngitis, systemic manifest complications could be pharyngitis, encephalitis, or even lower respiratory tract infection. Now there are a number of other complications which can be seen with the recurrent herpes simplex. The cranial nerve palsies, where they are affected, the areas of the involvement can come up with the cranial nerve palsies. We have neuralgic pain, then we have trigeminal neuralgia, eczema herpeticum. There are a number of eye complications. If these clustered lesions are present around the eye, we can have keratoconjunctivitis, dendritic ulcers, iridocyclitis, chronic uh, lymphedema can occur, the swelling and the lymph, lymph fluids can flow out from the lymphatics. They can produced with lymphedema, erythema multiforme. This is again a cutaneous manifestation in which we see targetoid lesion. Bell's palsy can occur if the facial nerve is involved and then there is again meningitis. So this herpes simplex though looking very simple and benign but can have a number of serious complications. Now going to the next counterpart that is herpes simplex virus 2 which we discussed that the herpes simplex has mainly two types herpes simplex 1 and 2. 2 is mainly limited to the external genitalia Okay, and this mostly affects the people after puberty. Again, the mode of transmission is through the direct skin contact and the recurrence is more frequent in this type that the patient might have even more than two to six uh, episodes of this infection per year. Again, the initial vesicles rapidly break down into painful ulcers. You can see the picture showing tiny small water droplet like these are vesicles all of must be familiar what are vesicles these are tiny fluid filled lesions which are less than 0.5 centimeter these vesicles may not be visualized as they ulcerates very quickly this is another picture you can see that there's a development of a large ulcer over the glands and the shaft of the penis. And these are the small, visualize, uh, please concentrate on the pictures. Okay, these are the tiny vesicles, small erosions, and this is a big ulcer. All the vesicles, uh, what you can say, combine to form a big ulcer. What are the symptoms? Again, they can present primary infection, infection for the first time and the recurrent again in a previously infected individual. They can have general malaise, sore and pain, very painful. The hallmark is the pain. Keep this in mind. Herpes simplex virus 2 has is known for its painful ulcers. Lymph nodes enlarge and tender and they can have pain and dysuria which is more common in the females. In the recurrent infection, again, the clusters of small vesicles, which we have discussed in the herpes simplex virus one, and the episodes are of shorter duration. In the herpes simplex primary, episodes are usually lasting for a two weeks. And in this, uh, uh, what you can say recurrent, these episodes finishes off in a shorter duration. 
Okay, again, the complications, depending upon the site, they can come up with the radiculopathy, sacral paresthesias, urinary retention, constipation, impotency, urethritis, proctitis. If the viral strain is type 1, they can come up with pharyngitis and certain urticarial lesions, small bumps and wheels all over the body. So these are the complications of herpes simplex virus type 2. Now, a brief discussion on the treatment. How will you treat the patient with herpes simplex? You can of you will give topical antivirals, which are acyclovir, pencyclovir, idoxuridine cream, but you this is usually for the mild labial herpes simplex. Keep this in mind, they are not used for the severe one, they are usually for a mild, mild disease. Patients usually come up with a severe infections, especially of the genitals, and what they are prescribed, they are prescribed oral acyclovir, that's an oral antiviral, and this is to be taken in a dose of 200 to 400 milligram, five times a day, for five days. Oral veracyc there are these are the newer antivirals, velocyclovir and famcyclovir. The patient who is having these recurrent episodes of viral infection, recurrent herpes simplex, should be kept on a prophylactic prophylaxis for frequent reactivation, which is a dose of 200 to 400 milligram again or once or twice daily for about six months. Keep this in mind, okay? This is only for the five days and this is for six days for the recurrence. Now, going to another very important virus which causes a very well-known diseases like chicken pox and herpes zoster, okay? This is belong again belonging to DNA virus family where cellulose zoster infections are species specific to humans. They cause us chicken pox and the prime, this is the, again the primary disease. This virus also becomes lies latent in the sensory root ganglions of the specific dermatomes and they come up with the shingles which is more common in the adult and this chicken pox more common in the children, teens and young adults. But the highest affected age group are the children and in this herpes shingles, older children, adults, and immunocompromised all right now going to the um, a little discussion on this what is this this disease has a prodromal illness of for about two days the infection manifests 14 to 17 days after the exposure so the incubation period is two weeks to two and a half weeks which means that the rash will come up after even this time what is the rash like? It starts with a raised pink or red papule, which breaks out over several days. These are again started with the small vesicles, which are formed from the raised papule. The initial lesion is a pink papule. Papule is the smallest raised lesion, less than 0.5, and then it becomes fruit filled. And then there is a crusting. So it passes through different stages. We'll be discussing and seeing the pictures in the Coming slide, the progression of the lesions from the start to the finish are itchy, irritable, and painful. Okay, now this is a picture. You can first concentrate on the picture. This is a small, tiny papule. This is a vesicle. What is typical? It's like a dew drop on a rose petal. What it is commonly described as a dew drop, a small drop of dew on a rose petal. Okay, so very important. You can see the small vesicles and the papule. Actually, the rash of the chicken pox is polymorphic. What does the term polymorphic mean? That, that the lesions are of different morphology. They would be papules, they would be pap vesicles and the crusting present in the same patient in one time. So again, the incubation period is two weeks to a two and a half week. There is a prodome of fever and malaise. How does the rash, typical rash, sometimes atypical presentation may come up with a morboliform or scarletiniform rash, but the typical rash is this. Tense, clear, unilocular vesicles like dew drops on the petals appearance centripetal distribution. What does this centripetal distribution mean? That the rash first starts on the trunk and then it progresses to the face, scalp, and the limbs. Another type of the rash is centrifugal that starts from the face trunk, uh, and the scalp and then it spreads to the trunk. So here the rash of uh, chicken pox is centripetal. That is, again, I'm describing it is present on the trunk and then it progresses ahead. 
the dry crust may form lesions at different stages vesicles common on the vesicles can come up also in the mucous membrane in the oral cavity okay dry crust one thing very specific of these chicken pox they leaves a small scar or a depression okay these are the different stages for about in a the, the whole of the process takes about two weeks this starts with a small papule this papule developed into a vesicle then this vesicle become pus filled or it's ruptured leaving a, a small crust Okay, this crust may become initially it is yellow colored and then with time it dries off. As it dries off, it's um, after 10 days, it starts to detach from the lesion. And as it detach, it leaves a small depression. So chicken pox is very important. A polymorphic rash in a centripetal distribution that is a there is a combination of papules, vesicles, and crusted lesions in a bot in a patient. Okay, this is another picture of the patient. You can see it's uh, of different morphology. If you concentrate on the picture on the right side, this is a crusted lesion. These are the small erythematous papules. Okay, this is a big crust, hemorrhagic crust, or a pus, uh, pus crust with yellowish in color. Okay, this is a whole generalized distribution of the chicken pox. Sometimes lesions can appear in the oral mucosas. Okay, the same infection when becomes after latency, it presents and reactivate, reactivates later in the life. This is called as herpes zoster or shingles. Okay, what is specific about that? That it has these distribution is dermatomal. You all must be familiar with the dermatomes, okay? So the rash is dermatomal. The rash of the chicken pox was centripetal. Here the rash is dermatomal. That is, the, uh, now how does the patient come up with the pain, fever, tenderness over the skin and the malaise may precede the rash. The patient might have prodomal symptoms, pain, and tenderness at the site of the skin, which has not yet developed blisters and vesicles. Okay, the rash will pass on through the same stages of papules, vesicles, and crusting develop over several days and as they evolve. So, but the most specific thing is that this is a dermatomal rash, which is caused by the reactivation of the latent herpes zoster virus. The virus is the same, but the distribution is different. One is the primary, that is chicken pox, and the second is the herpes zoster. This is a, another view. This is a rash of papules and plaques forming in a dermatomal pattern. Okay, and this is the closer view. This, these are the fluid filled vesicles and these vesicles uh, become older, they become pus filled, then they crust and they, they heal off with a little scar. Okay, uh, considering here, Look at the dermatomes which are involved according to their percentages. The commonest per, uh, dermatomal area which is involved is thoracic in 53%. And then cervical is involved in 20%. Then ophthal cervical, fish, trigeminal ophthalmic is involved in 15%. And the lumbosacral area is 11%. So mostly thoracic and cervical. And ophthalmic division also come up. This is the thoracic. This is a picture of ophthalmic and this you cannot actually very clearly see which areas, but this is these are the percentages. Okay. Sometimes the patient might not have the eruption of the vesicles at all, and they only complain of pain and burning in that area. That, that is called herpes zoster lacking eruption. Another term for is that herpes zoster sine eruption. Okay, the patient may present with the chest pain, with the back pain, with the fa facial pain, and later on their eruption occurs. This is the these are the typical pictures. Okay, this is ophthalmic areas of the trigeminal nerve, which has presented with the hemorrhage crusted lesion. Initial wasn't crusted, but as we, as we discussed, these lesions become crusted and secondary infected. So this is orbital cellulitis secondary to herpes zoster. What is this? This is again ophthalmic oh, trigeminal nerve, which is involved. Okay. This syndrome is called Ramsey Hunt syndrome. Okay, you can see the Bell's palsy here. Okay. 
Okay, the complication of disease is that the patient present with chronic peristatic neuralgia. What is that? That the patient's pain may persist one month or even three months after the eruption. The most common complication of this herpes zoster is post-herpetic neuralgia. What is it? Post-herpetic neuralgia, very tingling, current-like sensation, burning pain in the distribution which has been affected by these vesicles and lesions. How will you treat the patient? Again, antiviral, but here the antiviral are given in high dose, that is 800 mg for seven days. And they are best if they are started within 72 hours of the eruption. There, the uh, dose was a little lower in herpes simplex. If the eye is involved, then you have to give the patient with, treat the patient with intravenous acyclovir at a dose of five milligram per kg, eight hourly for four days. And sometimes you need to give like in Ramsey-Hunt syndrome or Bell's palsy, prednisolone is also needed, okay? Now, moving to another very important DNA virus is cutaneous virus infection, which is caused by human papilloma virus. This, these are again DNA viruses and the mode of transmission is again direct or indirect skin contact. And they are commonly present in the planter areas of those people who are going to the swimming pools or shower room floors, shaving may spread the warts over the beard area or certain sexual activity can also make the patient predisposed to these warts, which are genit located genitally, okay? So we'll be discussing another cutaneous infection, which is caused by the viruses, cutaneous warts. This is again, a very common thing which comes up in the OPT in all the age groups. What are the commonest sites? They, how they are classified, that is planter wart. You can see, first look at the picture. These are the rough, warty areas, dry, lusterless, shiny, and these are the small punctate hemorrhagic points, which you can see. Dry, rough areas on the planters. How they start? They start with the shiny grain papules, sagu grain papule, sagudana, which is commonly called as sagudana. They start off with a small papule, then they become raised and they become rough. Okay, they are surrounded by a thickened horn, collar of thickened horn. Normal skin makes a collar around them. The most common areas are the pressure areas. Sometimes they come up in closed clusters like a mosaic pattern on the floor. So they are called as mosaic warts. Okay, these are the planter warts. Keep this in mind. The human papilloma virus has about 180 types. Some are specific for the face, some are causing planter infection, some are causing genital infection, and some are causing common warts or plain warts on the face and the neck. So this we discuss as the planter wart. These are the other picture. This is a quite small papule, which is rough and keratotic. That is very important that the surface markings are disturbed. The skin is normal and this is rough, warty, painless. The hallmark of it, it is not usually painful, but sometimes when it becomes secondarily infected, it may become painful. This is a bigger version of that, a big keratotic, rough surface, warty, cauliflower-like. What is a what? It is just a rough cauliflower-like in appearance. Okay. Now, this is another presentation of human papilloma virus causing plain warts. You can see that they are not that rough and warty, but they are small, shiny papules, which are flat and smooth, varying from yellow, pink, gray color. They are round and the common sites are not on the foot, but they are usually on the face and the back of the hands and the lower legs. Okay, then they can come up with a linear arrangement. What this linear arrangement is taken as, whenever the patient itch or scratch or anything he might inflict a trauma, the papules come up in that line that is called Kobner phenomena, Kobner phenomena, that the disease manifests along the line of trauma. This is another picture of the same plain what small, tiny, shiny, painless, brown color to yellow color or pink color papules on the usually on the face or the back of the hands. This is another variety filiform. You can see the characteristic filiform that the finger like projections of the warts or their comma, they are termed as digitate warts. 
they are irregularly distributed they can be clustered and they are again usually present on the face and the neck but they can also come up on the scalp the common sites are the scalp for the digitate warts okay periangual wart the periangual warts are very resistant to treatment they can come around the nail in the nail folds under the nails and the nail biting may increase the risk of infection this again a very rough dry looking thickened areas common warts these are again warty lesions present on the dorsum of the foot they have a firm papule rough horny surface they are usually symptomless they are present on the back of the hands and the fingers again copner phenomena that is what is copner phenomena i just mentioned that the lesion occurring at the site of the trauma in the line of the trauma they are usually in linear arrangement how will you treat they sometimes resolve spontaneously but usually we don't let it resolve on its own we apply some treatment which are usually topical like some salicylic acid retinoic acid keratolytic agents irritants can be given or some other modalities like cryotherapy freezing the what with the gas nitrous oxide which causes coagulation of the proteins and in turn causing the death of the particle this is with a cooling gas which can be done with a cotton bud or a, we have a cryo gun electric cautery this is a machine which can be used to cauterize the what then we can have certain other modalities like lasers and surgical can be but the most if important are these cryotherapy and electric cautery okay now another viral disease which is caused by molluski pox virus is molluscum contagiosum keep this in mind this is also very commonly seen in the skin opd mostly in the childhood what is the organism molluski pox this is again a dna virus which can come up with different type 1 2 and 3 serotypes majority of the cases are formed caused by mcv1 like hsv1 we have mcv1 molluski molluscum contagiosum viruses which are found in majority of the cases the peak incidence is 2 to 5 years old age children due to direct contact in the swimming pools shared bathrooms or auto inoculation what is auto inoculation that a single papule in the patient rapidly increases in number by itself in the same patient more likely in a warm wet environment certain young adults can acquire this through sexual contact or sometimes the pregnancy or the immunocompromised states we have a severe and a really bad form of these molluscum contagiosum there are certain predisposing factors like atopic dermatitis hiv infection or any other immune status caused by any other problems which compromises the immune system of the patient so these viral infections can also be very commonly seen in the immunocompromised patient okay keep this in mind along with the healthy adults how do they look like you just concentrate on the picture these are small erythematous rounded papules and there is a central depression look concentrate at the center that there is a small punctum like thing or you can see this is an umbilication these are papules which range in size from 1 to 1 cm okay and these papule when they are squeezed they can give uh, out uh, they can uh, what discharge a cheesy material there is a material which is in these papules they can present in different stages in the same patient and they will resolve within 6 to 9 months but again we will not let, let them resolve on its own we'll give the treatment to the patient through treatment like caustic destruction like trichloroacetca which is commonly trichloroacetic acid and certain other uh caustic agents like phenol certain irritating cream like tretinoin adapalene potassium hydroxide and simple extraction that is puncturing it with a needle or with a toothpick stick and then squeezing out the cheesy material okay now moving to the dna rna viruses we have just completed the certain dna viruses which were very important like herpes simplex varicella zoster human papilloma virus and molluscum contagiosum virus keep this in mind now we are moving on to our rna viruses and the uh, viral infection this dengue which is caused by a mosquito the vector vector is the mosquito but the virus is belong to a flaviviridae family and how does it present 
the wide range of infection from asymptomatic to severe dengue hemorrhagic fever and dengue shock syndrome, which has a high mortality. What is the incubation period? It is three to 14 days presenting with a high grade fluctuating fever. Now, how does the rash look like? This is a rash, a macular papular rash. What is it? It is a macular papular erythematous rash, which is blanchable. In this picture, it is being very clearly seen whenever it is fre fresh or pressure is applied to it, the lesions blanch. Macular papular rash, that is a combination of macules and papules. How does it start? The rash develops usually on the third or the fourth day of the fever in half of the patients, which may be macular, macular papular, scarletiniform, or petechial. It fades when the fever subsides on usually around day seven. Mucosal involvement is seen in 30%. Okay. So this is a rash of dengue fever. Usually the treatment is symptomatic if the patient is feel having itching, anti-allergic, and certain soothing creams and lotions can be prescribed for the patient in dengue. Now, very important, again, measles, RNA virus infection, common age group are the young children. This belongs to RNA, makes a virus family. The incubation period is about 10 days to 12 days. How does the uh, disease start? A high fever, a prodome of fever after the exposure of the virus and which may last for four to seven days. What are the other features? A runny nose, cough, conjunctivitis, red and watery eyes, all right? What does the rash look like? The rash is again a macular papilla. What is this rash? A macular papilla rash. But this rash again has certain specific feature. What is the one specific features are the coplic spots. This is the mucosal involvement in which you see small white spots with the red surrounding area. You can see here, there is a central white area, bluish white areas, which is surrounded by the red areola, which is present inside the buccal mucosa usually on the second day. If the patient comes later on, these uh, spots will not be visualized. They are usually present opposite the lower second molars, okay? The rash, on fourth day of a rash erupts usually on the forehead and behind the ear. The rash started from the forehead and behind the ear and then it spreads downward like what we, this is a caudal spread of the cephalocaudal spread of the rash that it starts from the forehead, from the top and the back of the ear and then it descends downward from the face and eventually to the trunks and the limbs within 24 hours. How long the rash lasts? It lasts for five to six days and then it fades away. You can see the patient has conjunctivitis, photophobia, rhinitis, fever, and the widespread macular papilla rash. Again, the rash itself does not need any uh, treatment, specific treatment, but you can have a, give the patient symptomatic treatment for the fever, um, for the itching of the rash, anti-allergic, and vitamin A helps to clear the patients quickly and prevent it from its complications. Now, talking about the coronavirus, which is an RNA virus, which have shown some cutaneous manifestations, which can be very um, different, like a morphiliform rash, similar to the measles or dengue, which we have discussed, the papillar vesicular rash, like the chickenpox rash, which we have discussed, the petechial rash. The petechial rash is usually seen in vasculitis. So can we can have petechial rash. We can have a painful acral red papules and plaques, which is seen on the right side of the picture top of the picture that there is acral erythema, papules and plaques on the patient and urticaria, wheels and flares and dermal swellings all over the body. So this rash can come up in a patient of coronavirus like the papules and nodules on the hands and the feet, the papular vesicular rash on the body and the macular papular rash. This is the urticarial rash. This is a petechial rash of vascular, like vascular in origin. And you can also have a network of erythematous rash, which is commonly called as levido reticularis. All right. So the coronavirus can have a certain cutaneous manifestation, which is very important. Uh, also, which because it can commonly be confused with measles and dengue. So they all have, these RNA virus usually have a macular papillary rash, which are important 
to remember. Any questions? So this brings us to the end of the lecture, but we can have questions and queries. You can send me to writing or you can just um, unmute them if they want. Tarek, up and go push Lijia. If they have any questions. Hello? Can we have some questions, please? Okay, uh, measles rash is macular papular. Okay, keep this in mind. Rash of measles is macular papular, or we can say it's a morbidly form of rash. Papular vascular rash is caused is seen in chicken pox. Keep this in mind. Papular vesic vesicular means a combination of papules, which are small erythematous lesions, less than 0.5 centimeters, and vesicles are fluid filled lesion. The papular vesicular rash is seen in chicken pox and in measles, we have macular papular or morbidly form rash, which is commonly termed as morbidly form rash. Okay. You no, know, it is not necessary if anyone has chicken pox, it depends upon the immune status of that patient in the future. Anytime if the immune status system go down the patient have this shingles but it is not necessary for everyone to have shingles okay keep this in mind the virus may lie latent even for lifelong without manifesting and sometimes also understand the babies can also come up with the shingles may before they have any chicken pox what is the reason their uh, mothers might in uh, encountered this chicken pox during the pregnancy and the first manifestation in the baby might be even herpes zoster so it is not necessary for everyone to develop shingles any questions i'll be happy to take them Yes, I just mentioned it. patient can develop chicken pox, uh, sorry, patient can have shingles without chicken pox, but in that case, the patient might have been exposed in utero to that virus, okay? Okay, how to differentiate from the rash of molluscum contagiosum and varicella? Keep this in mind. What thing might confuse you is molluscum contagiosum is usually localized infection. It is not that widespread. But the again, the herpes zoster that is caused by varicella zoster can be localized. So what is the symptoms? Both of the rash start with the vesicle. The molluscum does not go through all these stages of vesiculation, pustulation, and crusting. And the molluscum rash is not painful. While the rash of the chicken um, herpes zoster is localized to the dermatome and it is painful. If you are confused molluscum contagiosum with the chicken pox, that's quite different. The patient would have constitutional symptoms of fever, malaise, body aches, cough, and the rash would be very much widespread for the molluscum. The rash is very much localized. They are not, whole, not involving the whole of the body. I hope this clears you. Yes. More questions are welcome.
Yes. Yes, we can have some more questions. I think we have a few minutes left. I'll be happy to answer your queries. Anyone? Any kind of query? Hello? Okay, molluscum has a dip that is commonly as um, known as umbilication and this chicken pox infection is very much widespread okay and in this the rash is acute molluscum usually has a patient usually has a long history this these infections are very important Molluscum is transmitted by direct contact. These most of the viral infections we have discussed are through the direct contact and the measles, this coronavirus is through, you know, respiratory droplets and the dengue is through mosquito, the vector. Okay, they are special vectors, the special types of uh, mosquitoes which transmit dengue, the herpes, varicella zoster, Chicken pox can also transmit through respiratory infection, molluscum contagiosum, human papilloma virus. They are through direct contact with the skin. 